Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Philippine event series of Bridges Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace, hosted through the International Peace Foundation by De La Salle University in cooperation with Far Eastern University. My name is Brother Bernard Oka, FSC. I will be your host for this afternoon. Please rise for the National Anthem of Timor-Leste to be followed by the Philippine National Anthem, and please remain standing for the invocation. invocation will be delivered by Brother Ricardo Laguda, FSC, President of De La Salle Araneta University. Let us remember that we are in the God's most holy presence. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Father, you once told us that you will instruct us in your ways and you will walk in our path. You instruct us through your prophet Isaiah to cease to do evil, to learn to do good, to seek justice, to correct oppression, to defend the fatherless, and to plead for the widow. You promise through the same prophet that the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow will feed the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat the straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the co cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. Last but not the least, your son told us once that blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. May this gathering be an occasion for us to learn from one another the importance of what peace can offer to the world we live in today. And in the midst of hatred, poverty, violence, war, and aggression, may the little child lead us to the promised land to become the children of God. St. John Baptist de La Salle, leave Jesus in our hearts. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> To formally welcome everyone to this afternoon's event is the President and Chancellor of De La Salle University, Brother Armin Luistro, FSC. Is there a chance for lasting peace? Dear colleagues, dear friends, we address a very intriguing and complex question this afternoon. 
Given our own experiences and the continuing conflict in the Gaza Strip, even as we speak, lamentable episodes of hostilities within nations in virtually every continent of the world, and the disparate conditions of economic development across the world, we may easily succumb to the view that peace, that long-lasting and substantive kind, is indeed beyond our reach. To assist us in addressing this question and to disabuse us from whatever the pessimism or cynicism we harbor, we are elated that we have with us a person who has seen through much of his life why the pursuit of peace should be our magnificent obsession. Our lecturer for today has spent almost four decades now sowing the seeds that will bring forth peace in his beloved nation. In doing this, he was compelled to seek residence elsewhere for more than two decades. Though he was recognized with the most prestigi prestigious prize as an instrument of peace, he went back to his nation at a time when it was ravaged by years of neglect by an occupying country. In the process, and after gaining independence, as he took on even more significant responsibilities, he has witnessed anew how difficult it is to pick up the pieces and eliminate all sources and forces that sow conflict. And yet, our distinguished lecturer persists and has even volunteered to help out in resolving the continuing conflict in our own Mindanao between the GRP and the AMILF. Friends, I do not wish to preempt our lecture in responding to the question that we raised this afternoon. All I can say is that the constituency for peace expands and the advocates and believers are prodded by the example set by those who we could consider as extremely committed to the pursuit of peace, not just in words, but in their very lives. De La Salle University is delighted and honored to host, in cooperation with our partner, Far Eastern University, this lecture by our esteemed Nobel laureate, our two institutions are both deeply grateful to the International Peace Foundation through the Bridges Program, represented by Mr. Uwe Morawitz, for their efforts in bringing some of the most influential thinkers and movers in the world to share their passions and convictions with us. We warmly welcome all our distinguished guests and eminent persons both from academe and industry, as well as the diplomatic core community, officials from the Republic of the Philippines and the city of Manila. I wish to extend a special welcome to the delegates of the ninth ASEAN Graduate Business and Economics Programs, as well as the ASEAN University Network, as well as the participants to the International Convention of the Young Economists Conference. Dear friends, it is my hope that our gathering today would bring us closer to the dream of another Asian peace advocate and dreamer, Rabindranath Tagore, a dream of a world where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, and where the mind is led forward into ever-widening thought and action 
into that heaven of freedom and of peace, let us all awake. Thank you for gracing us with your presence, and good afternoon to you all. On the occasion of the Philippine event series, Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace, hosted through the International Peace Foundation, De La Salle University will confer on His Excellency Professor Jose Ramos Horta, 1996 Nobel Laureate for Peace and President of Timor-Leste, the honorary degree Doctor of Humanities. I now call on Mr. Joaquin Quintos IV, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of De La Salle University, Brother Armin Luistro, FSC President and Chancellor of De La Salle University, and His Excellency, Professor Jose Ramos Porta, to join me on stage. Please stand at the center. Brother Armin Luistro will now read the citation. Whereas His Excellency Professor Jose Ramos Horta, who was born in Dili, the capital of Timor Leste, to a Timorese mother and a Portuguese father, grew up witnessing the sufferings of his family and the struggles of the Timorese under Indonesian military rule. Whereas he was educated in a Catholic mission in the small village of Soibada. At the age of 25, he was appointed foreign minister in the government of the Democratic Republic of Timor-Leste, proclaimed by pro-independence parties in November 1975. Whereas to plead the Timorese case before the United Nations, he served as the exiled spokesman for the resistance during the years of the Indonesian occupation of Timor-Leste from 1975 to 1999. Whereas in 1996, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize with Bishop Carlos Bello, the religious leader of Timor-Leste, and I quote, to honor their sustained and self-sacrificing contributions for a small but oppressed people, end of quote. A portion of the funds received from the Nobel Prize was used to establish the Jose Ramos Horta Microcredit Fund for the Poor, which is in full operation today with a payback rate of 97%. Whereas after the 1999 national referendum that overwhelmingly favored the independence of Timor-Leste, but thereupon triggered the Indonesia-backed militia to lay siege to the people, Jose Ramos Horta returned to his homeland to play a lead role in negotiating the institutional foundations for independence. Whereas in 2002, when Timor-Leste joined the United Nations, he served as the new country's Minister of Foreign Affairs, and in 2006, as its Prime Minister. He was inaugurated as President of Timor-Leste in 2007. Until today, he continues his role as the international voice of Timor-Leste. Wherefore, in recognition of his outstanding achievements as a leader, human rights advocate and peacemaker, the Board of Trustees and the academic community of De La Salle University, on the occasion of the Philippine event series, Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace, hosted through the International Peace Foundation, are pleased to confer upon His Excellency, Professor Jose Ramos Horta, courageous human rights fighter, distinguished peacemaker, Charismatic leader and builder of the Democratic Republic of Timor-Leste, Nobel Peace Laureate, the degree Doctor of Humanities, Honoris Causa. Given in the city of Manila this 15th day of January, in the year of our Lord 2009, the 98th year of De La Salle University, Manila, Philippines. Signed, yours truly, President and Chancellor, and, Jose, and Joaquin Quintos IV, Chairman, Board of Trustees.
Mr. Joaquin Quintos IV will read the authority from the Board of Trustees of De La Salle University. Upon the resolution of the Board of Trustees of De La Salle University Incorporated, in accordance with the pertinent provisions of Republic Act Number 7722, otherwise known as the Higher Education Act of 1994, and Memorandum Order Number 59, Series of 2007 of the Commission of Higher Education, dated December 3, 2007, De La Salle University hereby confers the degree of Doctor of Humanities honoris causa upon the Honorable Jose Ramos Horta, given the city of Manila on this 15th day of January in the year of our Lord, 2009. Signed, Brother Armin Luistro, FSC President and Chancellor, and yours truly, Chairman of the Board of Trustees. To impose the doctoral hood are Mr. Joaquin Quintos IV and Brother Armin Luis Congratulations, His Excellency Professor Jose Ramos Horta, Doctor of Humanities, Honoris Causa. We now pause for an intermission number from the renowned De La Salle University Chorale. Oh, 
kapistahan ng pagpapanumbalik ng sigla ng pisig na ating De La Salle University Chorale. Ladies and gentlemen, as you now know, this event is entitled Bridges Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace, a program hosted through the International Peace Foundation. To tell us more about the Bridges program, may I call on stage the chairman of the board of directors of the International Peace Foundation, Mr. Uva Morowitz. <laughs> Maganang hapon po, and welcome to the second ASEAN event series, Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace. Bridges is facilitated by the International Peace Foundation, a non-political and non-religious foundation under the common patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. The events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners, including the country's major universities. The second ASEAN-wide series of Bridges is an independent contribution to the Decade for a Culture of Peace and Nonviolence initiated by the United Nations General Assembly. It follows a series of 300 Bridges events, which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in Thailand since 2003 and in the Philippines since 2007. Increasing ethnic, political, religious, and social conflicts and the helplessness to respond to them without further stimulating the spiral of violence show us peace is not a given good. It has to be constantly learned, experienced, and created anew. Peace is not a passive state. Peace is a process which needs time, attention, and the participation of all of us. And peace begins with education. The seeds of peace need to be planted in schools, in universities, in the new generation. This is why the International Peace Foundation cooperates with major schools and universities, as well as with UNESCO in realizing this Bridges program. We believe in the importance of the education and scientific community of the Philippines by bringing the knowledge and wisdom of Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine and economics to this country. What these highly in demand Nobel laureates normally see of a country are airports and hotels. They, deliv they deliver their lecture, stay for one night and leave. We have invited them here not only to speak, but to share, to engage, to listen. They come here not for one day or one event only, but for various dialogues in different parts of the country without requesting an honorarium, 
because of their real interest in building bridges, because of their real interest in the Philippines. It is our hope that these are not the first and final visits of these Nobel laureates, but visits with many fruitful returns to build long-lasting friendship and to start, for instant research programs or other forms of cooperation with the local universities and schools. This is how bridges could develop into a long time and sustainable success for the Philippines to strengthen education as a basis for peace. I thank Brother Armin Luistro, de La Salle University and the organizing committee of today's event for taking up this opportunity of our cooperation and for inviting today the 1996 Nobel Laureate for Peace, His Excellency President Professor Jose Ramos Horta to this prestigious university. We look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribution to build bridges. Maraming, maraming salamat po. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Morowitz. To formally introduce our guest of honor, I present to you Dr. Lydia Chaus, President of Far Eastern University. Thank you very much, Brother Bernie Oka. I am wearing the honorary ties given to me by His Excellency, the President. I am privileged to uh, introduce our keynote speaker this afternoon, His Excellency, Professor Jose Ramos Horta, President of East Timor and 1996 Nobel Laureate for Peace. Professor Ramos Horta was born on December 26, 1949 in Dili, the capital of East Timor, to a Timorese mother and a Portuguese father. He was educated in a Catholic mission in the small village of Saibada, later chosen by the Revolutionary Front for Independent East Timor as its headquarters after the Indonesian in invasion of East Timor in 1975. Of his 11 brothers and sisters, four were killed by the Indonesian military. East Timor, about the size of our own Palawan province, is on an island located northwest of Australia and south of Indonesia, with a population of just over a million. Like the Philippines, it is a country with a tumultuous past, having been under the Portuguese colonial rule for 460 years and under Indonesian occupation for 24 years. It is the world's newest independent nation. It is in the context of the East Timorese struggle for independence that we can better appreciate the singular achievement of President Ramos Horta. Jose Ramos Horta was the leading international voice of the Timorese people. A moderate in the emerging Timorese nationalist leadership, he served as foreign minister in the Democratic Republic of East Timor government, proclaimed by the pro-independence parties in November 1975, and left East Timor to plead the Timorese case before the United Nations. He was only 25 years old then. His friends at that time mentioned that when he arrived in the United States, he only had $25 in his pocket. He survived by the grace of those who believed in his cause. In New York, he addressed the UN Security Council and urged them to take action in the face of the Indonesian military onslaught which would result in over 200,000 East Timorese deaths between 1976 and 1981, five years. In exile from his country from 1975 to 1999, he was the permanent representative to the United Nations for the Timorese independence movement, the youngest UN diplomat in history and international human rights figure he is one of the three central figures in the country's struggle for independence. In 1996, he, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize with Bishop Carlos Bello, 
the religious leader of East Timor, to honor their sustained and self-sacrificing contributions for a small but oppressed people. In 1999, under the umbrella of the United Nations, East Timor held a referendum allowing the Timorese to vote on independence. When the referendum results showed more than 85% favoring independence, Indonesia-backed Indonesia militia retaliation was unleashed across the country. They killed thousands in the streets, displaced hundreds of thousands, and burned 85% of the buildings in the country. After the entry of a UN peacekeeping force, and our Captain General now, uh, Jaime de los Santos, is in the audience, right there, the head of the UN Peace Forces in East Timor. Um, after the entry of the UN peacekeeping force, Professor Ramos Horta returned to his homeland to help rebuild the country from the devastation. Working closely with the UN and Sergio Vieira Melo, the head of the UN administration in East Timor until 2002, he helped to bring about peaceful elections of the country's president and parliament, which in turn drafted the country's constitution. After serving for seven years as Minister of Foreign Affairs, he stepped into the shoes of Prime Minister and immediately set about restoring calm to the country. In 2007, he was elected President of East Timor when President Shanana Guzmao decided not to run for re-election. Even while in exile, Jose Ramos Horta honed his academic skills in public administration, international law, and governance to better serve his country. He studied public international law at the Hague Academy of International Law in 1983 and at Antioch University in Seattle, where he completed a Master of Arts degree in Peace Studies the following year. He also trained in human rights law at the International Institute of Human Rights in Strasbourg in 1983 and attended postgraduate courses in American foreign policy at Columbia University in New York in the same year. He has been a senior associate member of the University of Oxford's St. Anthony's College since 1987. Professor Ramos Horta at one point was considered as a possible candidate to succeed Kofi Annan as United Nations Secretary General. He gave up that opportunity in favor of serving his country instead, although he had indicated that he might run for the UN position in the future. Today, he continues in his role as the international voice of East Timor. Ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency, Professor Jose Ramos Horta, President of East Timor, 1996 Nobel Laureate for Peace and Patron of the International Peace Foundation. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be here today at this prestigious uh, university. I have been to the Philippines on numerous occasions, as uh, most of you will be aware. And uh, I have the greatest uh, sympathy, admiration for you all, for what you have achieved for your own country in freeing from dictatorship in the past for your extraordinary resilience in uh, standing up to uh, the challenges that uh, you face. I met uh, Ninoy Aquino in New York when I was in exile. I heard him speaking at Columbia University. When I heard he was going to speak there, I immediately went there, found uh, a seat at the front row and was very impressed. One thing that impressed me most was he had 10 minutes to speak and he finished sharp 10 minutes and he was speaking without notes. Afterwards, I went to greet him uh, and he greeted me back effusively, called me my brother. 
that was uh, the first time I met Ninoy, and uh, then over the years when he was at Harvard, I spoke with him on the phone. I've, at, I think two weeks before he was making the fateful return to the Philippines, I spoke with him on the phone. And I remember telling him, don't you dare forget Timur when you become president, because many leaders, when they're in opposition, they're all very supportive, but when they get to power, they forget about us. And he said, how can I forget you, my brother? The People's Revolution, People's Movement in this country inspired a lot of us. Do not underestimate Filipinos, the faith, the hope you generated in many, in, particularly in this region, when you struggle for freedom, for democracy. We were very much inspired by you. Uh, I would like to start by clarifying uh, one point. I, uh, I did not volunteer, and I'm not volunteering to help uh, in the Mindanao process. A friend of mine contacted me on the email, email and said, would I be interested in helping? Obviously, as a Christian, as a human being, uh, each of us, whenever you ask, are you interested? Can you help on this and that and that? Of course, we have to say yes, of course, I can try to help. But I said in uh, the email, I'm very ignorant about the complexity of the problems in Mindanao. All I can say is I can read and I can listen. And if all sides agree, I can try to help. But when we say try to help, you can help in many other ways, not necessarily being a so-called mediator. This exercise hosted by the International Peace Foundation or so many other activities going on in the Mindanao, in the Philippines, involving civil society, is a contribution towards lasting peace and cultural peace uh, in the Philippines. That's what uh, I, I meant. Uh, what I'm happy to do is to mediate between uh, Ateneo and La Salle. <laughs> that uh, I thank. I think, I think that is more of a serious problem than the Mindanao. <laughs> the president of Ateneo, well, Davao, sent him, I was there yesterday, he sent you all his love. <laughs> the theme that there is uh, for uh, this series is lasting peace, an attainable dream. Of course, if you were to uh, listen to, I'm sure, because I've heard him so many times, I've conversed with him so many times, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he would dream along with you. He would, he, he would make you dream along with him that yes, peace is, in our world, is an attainable dream. I'm also a dreamer, but I'm a bit more practical and sometimes skeptical as I read humanity's history. Yes, peace in our planet is an attainable dream. Who knows, 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years from now. But as we review, or we revisit the history of the world, we don't even have to go far back before World War II. Just after World War II, one has to be really extraordinarily a optimist to believe that in my lifetime, in your lifetime, peace can be achieved throughout this world. Immediately after World War II, in this very region of the world, we had some of the most vicious conflict from uh, Vietnam to Laos to Cambodia. More than a million people lost their lives, all in the name of the struggle against communism or for communist ideals. Some dream of a better world than the one that prevailed in Indochina at the time. Others, way back from another continent, thought that it was their sacred mission to stop atheist communism from 
taking over in Indochina and maybe moving beyond Indochina. So they went to war, dropping more weapons, more bombs on Cambodia, neutral Cambodia, then all the weapons drop, all the bombs drop in Europe during World War II. Not to forget the Korean War in the 50s. And then in our more recent times, then came as U.S. retreated from Indochina, the Khmer Rouge took over in Cambodia, and we all know what happened. More than a million people, two million maybe, lost their lives there. All in the name of an extraordinary, quote-unquote, ideology. People's lives were wasted on the altar of yet another ideology. And the, the Europeans, that lived through World War II, one of the worst, probably the worst war ever in humanity history started in civilized Europe and caused the death of millions of people in Europe and elsewhere where the war also reached. Timor-Leste did not escape uh, World War II. Uh, Madame, uh, President of the Far Eastern University, uh, said uh, we were occupied by Portugal, uh, colonized Portugal, uh, and then Indonesia. But there was in between, uh, we, in the intermission, we were occupied also by Japan for four years. So almost like everybody uh, were interested in one way or another occupying Timor-Leste. Only to say that even more or less, they did not escape World War II. And yet, soon after World War II, we have to say soon after World War II, because in humanity history, 30 years, 40 years is nothing. Uh, look at what happened in the Balkans. Hundreds of thousands displaced, tens of thousands died, and then we saw the partition of the split up of uh, the former Yugoslavia. Of course, there are also extraordinary positive things that happen in Europe and uh, in the world since World War II. The advance of human rights slowly, gradually became an accepted universal principle. Even if we look back only 10, 20 years ago in this region, where there was still a debate amongst, in certain circles, whether human rights was indeed a universal principle applicable to all cultures, all regions, or there are some specificities such as Asian values. Today, I think even that notion of Asian values in a supposedly in conflict with the universal values of human rights, of human life, of the right of individual to be free from fear, from torture, that notion is also have been uh, discredited and we don't hear much now uh, certain elite groups in Asia invoking the so-called Asian values as against the universal applicability, the universal obligation of all states to honor the, the sacred principles enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, in the UN in Charter, in the two covenants, political, civil, and cultural rights, and social, economic, and cultural rights. So that is progress. Progress is extraordinary also how Europe moved beyond World War II. Last year, 2008, I nominated the European Union slash European Commission for the Nobel Peace Prize. I believe that the European Union, one of the greatest institutions that born out of the ashes of World War II, creating a borderless Europe. And unfortunately, the Nobel Committee in Oslo decided to give it instead to the European Union to uh, former president uh, of Finland, Marty Atisari. 
I don't know the CV, the curriculum, the history of Marty Atisari, except for what appears uh, in the media, but you might know, might recall, he was one of the last uh, mediators in the, in the Kosovo conflict on behalf of the UN, the European Union, and yet that uh, uh, conflict was not resolved as proposed by Marty Atisari. Today, Kosovo is independent, recognized only by 50 states. In Asia, only Malaysia has recognized. Many other countries in Asia and elsewhere are not recognizing uh, Kosovo's independence. You students of international relations, of politics, might wish to analyze, should, Philippines should, or ASEAN countries, the rest, recognize the independence of Kosovo? If not, why not? If yes, why should you recognize? If, after all, Kosovo was part of, the, of Serbia historically for hundreds of years, Kosovo was the center of Serbia, the soul of Serbia. Recognized as such, as recently as only two, three years ago, in UN Security Council resolutions, as integral part of Serbia. Suddenly, the powers that be in the UN reverse their position and support independence of Kosovo. How you reconcile that? How you reconcile the right of a people to self-determination and what sometimes might seem to be a contradiction? sovereignty of state. What should take precedence? The right of the people to self-determination or territorial integrity, sovereignty over all parts of the territory? This is a, it is a, a dilemma that many uh, countries facing today in the face of the problem of Kosovo. It only serves to illustrate the complexity of the many problems facing the international community today. The president of the university just referred earlier to the ongoing tragedy conflict in Gaza. Somalia, Sudan, the unresolved and ongoing suffering of the people in Burma slash Myanmar. In view of this, against this background, that is a bit uh, difficult for me to uh, believe and to lead you to believe that peace is possible in our entire world. It is possible in each country in some specific situations. Non-resolution of conflicts within a state is an indictment of all of us. Non-resolution of the conflict in Timor-Leste in the previous 24 years was an indictment of the international community, an indictment of the United Nations, of Indonesia. But then wisdom prevailed in Indonesia in 99 with the change of leadership there, change that was brought about by the people of Indonesia and Timor-Leste. We did not march into the capital, Dili, with weapons. The resolution of that conflict came about because wiser people in Indonesia decided enough was enough. Then through protected, protected negotiations, Indonesia withdrew. United Nations took over temporarily for two years and Timur acceded to independence. But that does not mean that some of the legacy of the occupation, legacy of the past that created a culture of violence, created so much trauma or that was resolved suddenly with independence. We can negotiate political agreements but it's far more difficult to heal the wounds in our heart, in our soul. 
that is much more complex process. In 2000, and in 2000 we had a major conflict within our uh, resistance forces and uh, to be created a def new defense force. Our resistance force was transitioning to a new modern force. One of the well-known fighters called Mr. L7, that was his code name during the resistance, charismatic, little education, abandoned the cantonment in the town of Aileu, and with 30 men, allegedly very heavily armed, went to his native town of Laga. He had a lot of popular support there, thousands of people there. I was asked by the then Mr. Sergio Vieira de Mello, the late Sergio Vieira de Mello, and Mr. Shanana Guzman to handle that uh, situation. And I asked them, as long as you give me carte blanche, green light, full authority to resolve. And whatever I work out with, it, with him, you have to accept. They agree. So I went to Laga many times, several weeks. But to make the story short, I finally convinced him to return to the capital with a huge entourage. And uh, what was the agreement? The agreement was this. He would not return to armed forces because I told Serge de Mello and uh, Mr. Sanana Guzman, I can resolve a political dispute, but I cannot resolve what goes on in the heart. Between him and the rest of his compatriots, a very deep division, a lot of resentment there, the way, because the way he perceived he was treated. So this will take time. He shouldn't go back. To him, I agree with, I told him, you shouldn't go back. Well, I propose that he would be made security advisor to the UN in Timor, security advisor to Ms. Shanana Guzman, who were given authority, vehicle to travel around the country. And since then, he has been such a well-behaved, and then uh, last year, ran for office and was elected to the parliament. But one critical issue was that I mentioned, so difficult. You can reach an agreement, political agreement, but do not disregard what goes on also in the psyche, in the minds, in the heart of people involved in conflict. In Timor-Leste, we inherit this years and years of abuse, of humiliation that uh, created this, uh, I wouldn't say culture of uh, violence, but uh, people are traumatized, and people who are traumatized by violence treat them appropriately. Treat them understanding what goes on in their minds, in their, uh, in their heart. In 2006, after a few years of relative peace, after 99, violence erupted in Timor. Few academics, Western simplistic-minded journalists who travel to a given country for a few days, sometimes if they work for a big newspaper, they don't even have a few days. They have only a few hours. They read things that were written by some other academics or some other journalists, they repeat the same mistakes made by the previous correspondent, the previous journalist, because they all read the same stuff, influenced by each other, make simplistic uh, assessment, evaluation of the situation. In my country, as they have done in many other countries that I have read them writing about. While uh, people like me took hours, days, patiently, going to the neighborhood, to people's homes, talking to the people, or they would come to us, talk with them, endless for weeks, trying to bridge 
the divide sometimes between the leadership and the people, leadership that are disconnected from the people, sometimes between rival groups, sometimes it's problem of misinformation, misreading, prejudices, sometimes it's issue of poverty, of land dispute, housing dispute, then some behind the scene manipulate, turn it into politics. Far more complex than what simple-minded journalists, uh, particularly from newspapers from Australia, from Portugal, uh, US, uh, foreign correspondents for Associated Press, Reuters, even the venerable BBC, in the absence of uh, on-the-spot coverage, in the absence of uh, fresh footage of what's going on, they do a story with background pictures of five years earlier, perpetuating misinformation to the viewers. I've seen it everywhere. And the media, in many instances, in our own countries, do not do their share of justice, of contribution to peacemaking. Exacerbate situations through sometimes their irresponsible coverage. You want to uh, let me share with you the story in Cambodia. Do you recall when a mob attacked the Thai embassy in Phnom Penh? Because a local radio station in Phnom Penh wrongly reported that a famous Thai singer had claimed, or actress claimed, that Angkor Wat was part of uh, Thailand. The mob went to the Thai embassy in Phnom Penh, ransacked, some people were killed and 40, uh, $50 million in damage was caused, which Thailand had to pay later. Uh, Cambodia had to pay. You recall a Newsweek story alleging that US soldiers in uh, Guantanamo had uh, flushed the Koran down the toilet. And that's from the venerable Newsweek. As it turned out, it was a false story. Newsweek did not bother to double check. And yet it caused so much destruction from Pakistan to Afghanistan. Lots of people were killed as a result of that. So each and every one of us in our societies have to take responsibility for creating conditions for peace. Only that way we can put up the building blocks of peace, block by block, in our countries, in our villages, in our provinces, in the, in the whole of the country, and maybe in the region and the, in the world. Is it possible to visualize Asia free of nuclear weapons? How can we dream of peace in Asia when Asia is one of the most, I would say, the most nuclearized region of the world? You don't have in Europe countries physically bothering each other, each with nuclear weapons. Two of them have it separate by the English Channel, and that's it. Asia, almost each neighbor has one nuclear weapon. I'm exaggerating, but you see from uh, Pakistan to India to China to North Korea, and then border with Russia, all possessing nuclear weapons. It seems that leaders in Asia 50 years ago, when they began a nuclear unrace, more or less, thought that that was their best pro protection of their national interest, their sovereignty, their territorial integrity, and the best way to invest their brains and money in solving issues of poverty. We are not able to bring clean water to poor villages in mass of Asia, and yet we have science, we have technology to develop the most destructive weapons ever invented by humanity. 
But are these weapons of any use to save the empire, to save the country? Let me share with you, to conclude, the following. I was traveling once in uh, Switzerland from uh, this, the very boring town of Nyon, that nothing happened ever, but that's where I stay because some friends of mine give me free accommodation whenever I go to expensive Geneva to do my international human rights lobby. Every morning, in driving from Nyon to Geneva, I would tune in to the ever-loyal companion, BBC. 8 o'clock, 8 a.m. sharp, the news come from London. And that morning, in 90 or 91, I think it was 90, came the story of a Soviet cosmonaut who had been to, in space several months in one of those record-breaking missions in space. That morning, as he was preparing the spacecraft to return to Earth, he received orders from Moscow. Do not return. Circle the Earth for a while. Your country no longer exists. <laughs> Soviet Union, the mighty empire, ceased to exist. I stopped the car because in normal circumstances I'm a very bad driver, always distracted. With that news, I said, I better stop. I was totally startled. And it began to reflect on the end of history. That was the end of one history. The mighty army of the Soviet Union was not able to save the bankruptcy, from bankruptcy, the Soviet elderly, who presided over 50 years of illusion and of oppression. Who thought possible that the Berlin Wall would come down crumbling in our lifetime? Václav Havel walked out of prison, became president of the new Czech Republic, and the contagion effect took place. A few years later, Nelson Mandela walked out of prison. This is only to say that, A, no amount of force of weapons can resolve our basic daily problems or our basic survival. Or no amount of force can prevail over our ideals, our convictions. It's so tragic that sometimes it takes years and years and years of people losing their lives. And then in the end, you realize you have to negotiate. Negotiate with the same people that you call bandits, you call criminals, the previous 20 years, the previous 30 years. In the meantime, thousands have died. Today, much of the West call Hamas a terrorist organization. But much of the West, the UN, all sponsored the elections that took place in Gaza. Only that the election was won by their own people, by Hamas. And then Condi Rice, Secretary of the State, that was so such an enthusiastic proponent of the election in Gaza, realized the people of Gaza were wrong. She didn't go as far as change the people, but tried to change the regime in Gaza. And the result is this. I'm sorry to say, but uh, the international community, the West, contributed to this spiral of violence in Gaza because you cannot sponsor democracy, encourage democracy, one of the tools of democracy for people to exercise their will is election. And Hamas won the election. You cannot turn around and say, sorry, but you shouldn't have won. And now we're going to punish you because you won the election. So that's part of the problem. However, I believe 
as it happened with Yasser Arafat. You might recall, Yasser Arafat was a terrorist, quote unquote, for many years, 20 years or more. He won the Nobel Peace Prize in 94, together with Isaac Rabin and Shimon Peres, for their courage in reverse course. He was no longer a terrorist, became a respected international statesman. Who knows? A few years from now, the Hamas leaders will become also international statesmen, as Arafat was. My point is only to say that before we label others, all sorts of names, they refuse to talk with them, let's think through carefully. In my own country, a Portuguese judge in our court, Supreme Court, because we still have lack of enough judges, prosecutors, we have many from different nationalities, particularly from Portugal, Brazil, Cape Verde, because of our legal system. We rely a lot on uh, those friendly countries that have a civil law system. And as I refuse to give green light to our army police, I refuse to give light to the international security force in my country, to which is there, the UN, Australia, New Zealand, to launch military operations against the so-called rebel group of Miss Alfred Reynaldo. That little Portuguese judge issued a statement, although his own country was only 30 years democracy, because Portugal became only a democracy after 75, before that was a dictatorship, giving a long lecture to the president of Timor-Leste about democracy, that the president was interfering in the justice sector. All I said was, and in that I was backed up by the UN and all my colleagues, as long as there is a chance for me to persuade Mr. Alfred Reynaldo and his people, A, not to use violence, B, to surrender themselves to justice, I will oppose the use of force. So I went to the mountains, to the villages, meet with Mr. Reynaldo. I would send my representatives to talk with him. He even had access to my telephone. I got pledged from him in 2007. He would not interfere with the elections. And he didn't. And I told Mr. Ferrer Reynaldo, as long as you don't harm anyone, as long as you don't use weapons, against anyone. I will not allow anyone to come and attack you. However, you have a, at some point to give yourself up. And I told him, give up weapons. You play too much with guns. With guns, you'll be killed. I told him, remember what the Bible says, you who kill with steel, with sword, you'll be killed the same way. Not exactly a literal translation. The Catholics here in this university will probably recall better <laughs> what the Bible actually said, but that's more or less the meaning. And I told him, look after your wife and children. He responded, I don't care about my wife and children. I care about the people. I told him, don't tell me about that you care about the people when you don't care about your wife and children. A person who say he doesn't care about wife and children care about the people. Because many in the struggles for many decades always said that I don't care about my family, I care about the people. You don't care about your family, you don't have sentiments about those of your blood next to you. Don't tell me it's a lie. You have no sentiments. Test of leadership, quality of leadership is compassion. More than brains. What is the use of a number of PhDs, masters on your CV? Extraordinary brain if you are not compassionate. You don't have a golden heart. 
our CVs, our PhDs, our brain can lead us to catastrophes. You know what has happened around the world. And even today, I don't, every time someone comes to me and say from the United States or Europe and say, I have a PhD in economics, in banking, I say, excuse me, what happened to the international economic financial crisis in, uh, with all these PhD in economics around the world? We are in this mess. Not that I want to listen now to philosophers, but in my country, anyone showing up with on his or her CV saying, I worked five years, 10 years in Wall Street, well, we'll get immediately ordered to leave the country. <laughs> so I don't, <laughs> but anyway, test of leadership is compassion. Test of leadership is humility. Because when we don't have those sentiments to try to understand the other side, to listen to the other side, and this is a problem also in my country, how so difficult sometimes to bring different leaders together to talk. And sometimes when I talk with some of them individually, there are no differences. But then to get them to work together, pride, emotions, something that happened in the past, come into it. And that's why I say those responsible have to have greater patience. Only that way we can realize the dream, peace in our lifetime, peace in the world. And last but not least, to thank the Filipino people to President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, who in the last few years has presided over the strengthening of relationship between our two countries. In 2006, I talked to President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, telling her that I want to see as many Timorese students come into this country. I was Prime Minister at the time. She promptly agreed then I talk with the current Prime Minister, Mr. Shanana Guzman, who most of you have known, have heard of, a man of tremendous, great compassion. Way back when I was Foreign Minister in 2003, 2004, I began to argue that we must elect Philippines as one of the main country of destination for our students because of so many similarities and the quality of education. Today, Timor has enough resources from oil and gas, although still modest, but enough for us to be able to invest seriously in education. So, Philippines is uh, receiving now at least 100 students, and I insisted back then, the Prime Minister thoroughly agree, priority is in the field of science and technology. So the first group has arrived. I don't know how many to La Salle University. I think most gone to Ateneo, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I confess, I even don't know where they've gone. I know only they come to the Philippines. <laughs> and uh, we pay almost all the costs. Uh, Philippines charge us only the domestic fee which is huge difference. And this is the first group of Timorese to come here. We have a, Australia, one of the richest countries in the world, uh, offering us uh, 10 scholarships. I argue with John Howard, former Prime Minister of Australia back then, a few years ago, to at least take 100 Timorese to TAFE, the vocational training schools in Australia. He looked at me, not terribly uh, convinced, uh, touched by, by that. So today we have only 10 scholarships offered by Australia. <laughs> our government paying 30 scholarships to go to, uh, to our students go to Australia. United States, uh, more generous than Australia, provide six scholarships. 
Cuba, one of the poorest countries in the world, and according to the United States, one of the least generous countries in the world, that creates so many problems to the United States. Cuba offers 800 scholarships to Timorese students. We have 800 Timorese studying medicine in Cuba. Almost, I would say, 98% of the cost bear by the Cubans themselves. We give only the per diem, the $50 pocket money to our students. We have 300 Cuban doctors working in Timor. Almost all costs covered by the Cubans as well. Plus, uh, we have 150 medical students, uh, our own medical students, studying in Timor under Cuban doctors. They're the ones who set up our uh, medical school. And we are eternally grateful to, uh, to uh, President Fidel Castro, President Raul Castro, for uh, what they are doing uh, in support of us and so many countries in the developing world. 35,000 Cuban doctors are working in developing countries for the last 40 years. What a tremendous burden uh, to Cuba. What an extraordinary display of generosity, regardless of the ideologies or the political system in each country. Fidel Castro has been in office for 40 years. Their political system allowed that. I have uh, no plans to be 40 years in office. <laughs> if uh, I serve my full term, 12 years, uh, oh, sorry, I mean 2012, uh, the next, <laughs> I think that was a Freudian slip. <laughs> If I serve a full term till 2012, so another three and a half years, maybe. I'm not even uh, uh, certain that I would want to serve the full term. I accept to be prime minister in the worst of the crisis in the country. I ran for president because Shanana, the bishop, told me to run for president. The country today is at peace. Economically, we're doing well. Last year, 10% growth, real growth. We have a surplus of more than $4 billion in our petroleum fund. We, and we want to go to that fund to finance our education, give chances to our young generation to prepare for the future. There are many people who can do the job other than Jose Ramos Orto. We have great, extraordinary people in the country who have contributed far more to the country's freedom than myself. And so much so that when I returned home in 99, in 2000, I handed over the gold medal of the Nobel Peace Prize to the head of our resistance fight, fighters in Timor. In 96, I said in Oslo, they are the real, referring to the resistance fighters, they are the, those who really deserve this prize. It was not only rhetoric. In two, August 2000, in a ceremony, I handed over this uh, prize to them. I will clarify also that uh, um, uh, my CV, which uh, you can pull out of the internet, is completely outdated. Not that it has become richer, only that there have been some failures uh, in my career. I set up this uh, microcredit, which worked very well in 2000, with uh, part of the money from the Nobel Peace Prize. But uh, only a few weeks ago, I was contacted by Timor Aid, the Timorese NGO managing it, saying that because of many problems, because of 2006 crisis, there is a lot of unperforming, non-performing, uh, you know, I don't even know the technical names for this. And uh, so what should I do? I said, listen, when I gave you the money, I never expected that you want to give me back. I don't care. Uh, the poor people are not able to pay, so forget about it. The rest of the money was still in their account. I said, Let's use the money to pay your own cost. So if you have this microcredit uh, in my CV on the internet, uh, delete it. It's no longer uh, valid. So I'm no, longer, <laughs> I'm no longer in charge of any microcredit, micro just a clarification. God bless you. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Our esteemed guest has uh, been kind enough to permit us to have a portion of question and answer at this point in the program. Uh, there are two mics at the center aisle for those of you who may want to ask a question. Uh, please introduce yourself and tell us the organization or the school affiliation that you are a member of uh, before you ask your question. Those who have PhDs are allowed to ask questions. Uh, so yes, uh, please, uh, I see someone, please come forward here. The, the mic is here. I think you are a member of the conference of uh, young economists from Indonesia. Am I? Yes, please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Marta Safitri from University of Indonesia. I'm curious for one thing. What Indonesia mean for you and for Timor Leste? That's the first question. And the second question, because the theme is about peace, uh, can you give us advice what the student can do to attain peace uh, maybe for Asian region? Thank you. Can you repeat the first question, please? The first question, what's the means of Indonesia for Timor-Leste and for you as individual? Thank you. The meaning of Indonesia for me. Well, uh, I uh, would like to say the following. I could have said in my own uh, remarks uh, is this. The normalization of relations, the process of reconciliation between Timor-Leste and Indonesia should have been, could be a case study for many other countries that share, that have similar history of conflict in the past. In 2003, actually 2002, immediately after our uh, restoration of independence, I w went with Mr. Shannon Guzman, then president to Jakarta. His first state visit back then was to Indonesia. My first state visit as president was to Indonesia. SBY, President SBY, Sposilo Bambayudion of Indonesia, his first state visit abroad was to Timor when he first elected. When Shanan Guzman went to Jakarta after he was elected president after independence, he was received with full honors. And as I saw the Indonesian military band playing our national anthem, 21 gun salute, I did not think of the moment of our triumph. It would be normal. That was moment of our triumph. No, I thought of the extraordinary sense of pragmatism, realism, generosity on the part of the Indonesian side. That was an army, Indonesian army, that although not militarily defeated in Timor, they were not. No one should have illusions that the Indonesian army was defeated. They left, as I said earlier, A, the Suharto regime came down crumbling, result of student demonstrations, B, then there were negotiations with the UN, ourselves, a referendum was held, and Indonesia vacated the territory. But they were very wounded in their pride. They could have very well said, you want independence, now be on your own. They wouldn't have to do anything bad, just be indifferent to Timur, turn their back. They haven't done that. They walked halfway to meet again with the Timorese and help us in our own process of consolidation of our independence. No two countries have more important relationship than that, Timor-Leste and Indonesia. No other more important neighbors for us than uh, Indonesia and obviously Australia, the two neighbors we have. But Indonesia has shown extraordinary sense of, uh, it's admirable, their attitude. And be 
Because of that, partly of that, Chanana, myself, we have always argued against those few, very few in my country, some in the international community, including in the United States and elsewhere, who keep pushing for an international tribunal on Indonesia for the violence in 99 and in the past. When I was foreign minister and today as president, I keep telling some politicians, some NGOs in Timur, do you want an international tribunal on Indonesia? Find another president. I'm not going to do it. As long as I'm president, I would oppose it. A, because there are many reasons why I, I would oppose, but to make it short, we, we were freed in 99 because Indonesians liberated themselves. They have gone through also a very complex transition to democracy. You're all familiar with the developments in Indonesia since 1999. Some of the problems similar to the Philippines. Internal, political, violence problems, but then they overcome. Today, Indonesia is a flourished democracy, very strong civil society, strong media. The extremist elements are minority. In successive elections in Indonesia, they lost. The more secular parties won. And we, the Timorese side, in, and in view of the way Indonesia related to us with a sense of solidarity, we go around and say, well, let's set up an international tribunal to cause them problems. Well, I don't have many virtues. I'm, a, as a human being, I have flaws and sins, but one uh, virtue I think I have is loyalty. I never stab a friend or a country in the back. Pushing for an interest tribunal on Indonesia is stabbing SBY in the back, stabbing Megawati in the back, and the Indonesian people. So that is our, and today the relationship, not only government level, but people to people. When SBY came to Timor in 2005, thousands of people came to the streets to greet him. We have still thousands of Indonesia living there. In 2006, while some Timorese were busy killing each other, not a single Indonesian was touched, and for that matter, any foreigner. So that is the, we have a great uh, admiration for that country. And one last, maybe one other lesson from our experience. As you know, we are majority Catholic, 97, 95% Catholic. Indonesia, as you know, majority Muslim. But for many years of our struggle, never once you would hear from me in my speeches in Washington or anywhere, or from Shanana Guzman or any Timorese leader, trying to demonize Indonesia because Indonesia is Muslim. It was never a religious conflict. It was a political one. It was a result of Cold War mentality. And I even told in, in, Indonesia, in Washington once in a forum, when some people raised this issue, I said, listen, Suharto in Indonesia, one thing you cannot accuse him is discriminating when it comes to violence. Everybody gets, whether you're Muslim, whether you're Catholic, you're Protestant, doesn't matter. If you oppose him, you get crushed. So, so Hartu could never have been accused of discriminating when it comes to violence. You ask the Achinese, the most Muslim in Indonesia, they were at the worst end of the violence under Suharto regime. Well, uh, I, I, I believe that uh, my remarks and my answer uh, should answer all to your second question, what young people should do. But in a nutshell, for me, sometimes it may be in a very practical uh, way I tell young people in Timor and elsewhere, study, study and study. Not to be just good. I was always a very uh, average student, 
never study very hard. The eve, the eve of the exam, I tried to study what I didn't study for many months. <laughs> and then get upset when you get only B or C. <laughs> so you get surprised. Well, study, study, and study to be the very best for the pride of your family, pride of your neighbors, your village, pride of your country, to serve your country, to serve humanity. Thank you. Any other questions? Brother, okay, this gentleman first, and then Brother uh, Joseph. Brother Joseph, you can stand to the mic over there already, but maybe we have our, this gentleman first to ask the question. Please introduce yourself. Yes. Good afternoon, Your Excellency. I am Melo Acuna from Radio Veritas and the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines Media Office. I had the chance to visit East Timor twice. I had the chance to interview you in 1996 in Darwin when you were banned from uh, getting into the Philippines during the APEC conference. I'd like to find out, Your Excellency, what has the role or what has the Catholic Church done in nation building in East Timor? I saw the burnt convent of Bishop Carlos Jimenez Bello in 1999. Do tell us more about it, please. Well, when I was campaigning for president, you know, you look the way I dress, uh, I can pass easily for a bishop or a cardinal. That's true. Yes. <laughs> so, and uh, I always joke with uh, the electorate, the people. I say, listen, look at me. And uh, then I show the poster of the, my uh, colleague, Mr. Luolu, who's a great man. Uh, I said, listen, do you want to vote for Mr. Luolu for president, or do you want to vote for the cardinal for president? <laughs> and they all say, we vote for the cardinal. <laughs> so I was, the church has, a, it's part of our history, the oldest institution in the country, the only one that can claim to have hundreds of years of experience, but beyond that, it is the church that provides the glue of Timorese identity. The church has contributed enormously to education, to health, to culture over the years. Most of us went to poor Catholic mission schools, helped, guided by the priests and nuns and teachers there. We are doing a nov uh, a quite, I think, a new experience that I don't know many countries, uh, some countries have the same experience, some even wonder why we're doing that, whether that is already blurring the separation of church and state. In that the state providing uh, grants, finance to the churches. We started last year. I argue for it since when I was foreign minister. In respect to the church, but also in a pra pragmatic way. The church is an extraordinary institution of education. No better quality of education than, uh, in Timbu than what coming from the church. So if we give them more means, they can expand and even better serve the people. So last year we started 1.5 million for each of the dioceses, plus supporting other uh, projects that the church put forward to us, the priests, the nuns put forward to us. So anyway, that is, uh, but also in peacemaking. And I have to say, some of the Filipino priests in Timor have been, uh, I, Father uh, Giorgio in Laga, Father uh, uh, Juan Indili, I don't remember his name, in the wars of the crisis, he was helping me in the midst, uh, connecting with the youth, uh, with, with courage. And uh, Filip Filipino nuns, together with many others in Timor, an extraordinary role in healing the wounds, providing shelter, education. Your Excellency, one last point. Uh, I'd like to find out how far have you gone in developing your agriculture? I saw your potential in agriculture in 1999. I would say only uh, with this government, 
uh, uh, much more serious effort is being done on the agricultural sector. Why, and I say only with this government, not in criticism of the previous, because the previous had little money. So uh, they laid the foundation for our agricultural sector, but only this government has been able, because only in 2004 and five we began to receive abundance of revenues from oil and gas. And what is the uh, system we provide into our agricultural sector? Besides buying tractors, hand tractors to the communities, one important thing we have been doing is to buy uh, the producers, the non-perishable like uh, corn, uh, cassava, beans, rice from the farmers. Because in the past the farmers had no incentive because why producing more? No one buys them. The price is very low. So this government began last year to start buying. People are very happy. Finally someone is buying their goods, money entered the market. I take, uh, I don't take credit, but I take pride in having argued for this for a long time. In a meeting with uh, donors, European Union, Japan and the Americans, I told them, because they always advise us, don't subsidize your agriculture, don't do this, don't do that. And when I was Prime Minister, I said, well, I'm going to do it. I learned from you people. You three are the ones who subsidize more agriculture anywhere in the world. Hmm. So why are you telling me? You know, you subsidize your very rich farmers, and you tell us we should not subsidize our poor farmers. <laughs> what kind of logic is that? Yeah. <laughs> well, we, if you call it subsidy, fine, you know, but what we're doing is, one way is to buy their produces at least for the next few years. Even though the rice uh, price has gone down significantly since six months ago, now to about $300, the government is in Timur buying local rice. We are still paying $700 per ton. So that means what? Inject money in the rural economy. Because I always argue, the poor, if you give them money, they are not going to go to Singapore, to Bali for holidays. They are not going to buy expensive perfumes. They are not going to buy lipsticks. They are going to buy a few more eggs, a few more chicken in their neighborhood, in their community. So you are generating wealth in the communities. And so that's what we are doing in support of our agriculture. But productivity is still low. With the help of China, Japan, and Indonesian private sector, we are attempting to increase the yield from now in very embarrassing low, less than two tons per hectare, we hope to increase in the next two, three years. With, if weather conditions are good, we can increase to about to four or five tons per, he per hectare. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Brother Joseph. Your Excellency, I'm Brother Joseph Scheider from the De La Salle Physics Department. I was happy that you brought up the issue of nuclear weapons. I'm afraid they, uh, that issue has not been much in the news or the mass media and there are thousands of these in the U.S. and Russia and other countries of the world. Some people are saying now might be a good time to try to uh, reignite the discussions about nuclear disarmament. Do you think the uh, coming change in the U.S. administration uh, might be helpful in that direction or what are your comments on that? Well, I. Uh I, like many people around the world, have high hopes, high expectations with President Barack Obama. He is a person who, because of his background, because who he is, he knows poverty, he knows suffering, he knows exclusion, but he knows also the chances, the opportunities, the possibilities. A bit like, very much like John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy, life was cut short. We don't know what he would have done. But uh, his influence, you know, his legacy still felt all over the world just from that creating hope, uh, dream in us. If he, it, if he doesn't do it for a long, long time to come, I don't know who can do it. 
Yes, nuclear weapons are a serious issue. One of these days, the world will wake up and find that some nuclear weapons have gone into someone's hands. In 2000, in, in 92, in 92, I was, I, uh, as part of my uh, academic work with the University of New South Wales in Sydney, I organized a UN Security Council model to simulate, uh, we did many, some real problems, but some hypothetical. I don't mention now the, the case, but I designed a hypothetical case that was in April 92 of uh, a group of alleged terrorists, 12, had entered the nuclear installations of a country, I don't really say where, whether Pakistan, India, Russia, but at the time it was specific design, today I don't mention the name, and then they threatened. You give us freedom or we annihilate all of you. Well, that caused a tremendous discussion, you know, because then you end negotiations and so on. But anyway, this is a real possibility one day. Maybe only then the Americans, the Russians, the Chinese, the Indians, the Pakistanis start rushing towards shutting down nuclear weapons. Before that, unfortunately, it's such a sad situation. You know how someone can believe today? You know, I can understand during World War II, immediately after, the mentality at the time, the mental status at the time of the leaders, we have to protect ourselves. The enemy is going to attack now. But today, still hostage to that World War II, immediate post-war mentality and possessing or wanting to possess nuclear weapons, what a poverty of uh, brains of intelligence. Thank you very much. Is there any, yes, please. Uh, okay, uh, this student first and then please stand by the mic. Good afternoon, Your Excellency. Uh, I am Rainfred L. Ruiz from the province of Nueva Ecija at the Arroyo University FINMA Education Network, Pulsa student. May I ask your opinion about the, the change of leaders, leadership in the United States of America? Do you, think is the change, do you think is the change of leadership in the United States of America will or will contribute big in the effort of peace in the world. Thank you. I would say so uh, in regard to President Barack Obama and uh, many, many good people around him, many good people in the US Congress. They will not produce miracles. They will not deliver everything you expect of them. But I believe Israeli-Palestinian conflict will be dealt with in a more balanced way. As long as Palestinian leaders, A, reconcile, B, also refrain from violence. In regard to Hamas, although I don't associate myself with the label they are put by the West as a terrorist organization, I would say that when we are leaders of a people, leaders of a community, particularly when we aspire to be leaders of a state, when we want to form a state like the case of Palestine, well, there are certain norms of behavior. There are certain rules that we have to observe we have to be extremely prudent in what we say and what we do. If we 
because of frustration, anger, we surrender to violence, because of the perceived violence inflicted on them by the Israelis, I say perceived because I don't take, uh, you know, I don't want to stop making uh, judgments. The Palestinians, they feel, they know, they don't have it be told how they are suffering. But regardless of that, if you do not resist to the temptation of answering violence with violence, well, you lose all your morals. What is your moral authority? If, if to an Israeli violence, you re re react with violence. What is Israeli morality when, because of uh, Hamas rockets, they blockade the country completely and uh, launch the war they're launching? And the US sanctions on Cuba. You know, I said I was the only pres president speaking in the General Assembly in New York just past September, calling on the new U.S. administration to abandon the policy of sanctions on Cuba, out of morality. You cannot, because of the perceived sins of leaders, and again I emphasize the word, perceived sins of the leaders, per as perceived by you, impose policies that affect everybody else that you know very well are going to be victimized. Will Barack Obama do just that? And I said, you know, uh, in my speech, if the new administration does that, my admiration for the U.S. goes one notch up. If it doesn't, my heart will bleed. Will he respond to your illusions? Because many millions of people had illusions about, illusions in a good sense, you know, not about Barack Obama. Well, I was a few weeks ago in an orphanage in a remote village in Timor. The kids aged five to 11 or so, I asked them, are you following the American elections? And they all said yes. They knew who were the candidates. And I asked them, who are you going to vote for? Every single one of them is screamed the name Barack Obama in a remote village of Timor. Barack Obama got more votes in Timor than I got as from, uh, when I was elected president. <laughs> so, will he uh, deliver to us, to the world? Very difficult. The forces, the Contrary force in the United States, not underestimate. We will allow two more questions from this gentleman and sister over there. I'm sorry, but this is all the time we have. Your Excellency, my name is Setio Nomiharjo from Gajah Mada University from Indonesia. You have been successful in bringing peace uh, into your country, Timor-Leste, and also you know, between Indonesia and East Timor. Do you have any advice to the people in conflict now in Gaza Strip? And what do you think the world should do to end that conflict? If the world asks you, would you be willing to be ambassador of peace and bringing peace to the Middle East? Thank you. Well, I gave a lecture a few, two years ago in London, LSE, following my talk, One Young Palestinian came to talk to me and said, uh, how come you are so small uh, and you've been independent and we in Palestine, 50 years, no independent? Well, I told him I don't want to give lectures to anyone uh, how you should conduct yourselves, but I said, I told him, in my country, for uh, the 24 years of Indonesian occupation, not one single Indonesian civilian of the many thousands who are there, teachers, uh, farmers, street vendors, civil servants, their families, was touched by the resistance. And I always told the resistance at the time, you touch an Indonesian civilian, I quit. I would never be part of a movement, a cause that on behalf of it, use violence indiscriminately. 
and we never did. We were very good in killing each other, but never touching Indonesian civilians. <laughs> and that is a remarkable tribute to our people, not to me, but to the people. So I told this to the young Palestinian. I said, listen, the past 50 years have shown you already you cannot defeat Israel militarily. All kinds of violence were attempted to terrorize the Israelis. And I said, if you were to pursue Mahatma Gandhi civil disobedience, you might even be more successful. Just imagine four million Palestinians sitting down, refusing to do anything. What are the Israelis going to do? A, I told him, don't demonize the Israelis, the Jews. These people have high morals. Remember in 1982 at the Shabra Satila massacre, the first demonstration against the Shabra Satil massacre in Lebanon, not even committed by Israelis, but by the phalangists in southern Lebanon, were done by, the first demonstration was done by Israelis. 400,000 Israelis took to the street to protest against Menachem Begin and Ariel Sharon. And they demanded an investigation. If Palestinians were to do civil disobedience, you would have hundreds of thousands of Israelis also joining. They would achieve far more quick solution than uh, these few rockets fired by Hamas. So that's my, I told this young gentleman, and I have told my Palestinian friends, on day one of our independence in 2002, we recognized the State of Israel, established diplomatic relations, and also immediately with Palestinian authority. So that should be my, uh, we have a very balanced position on that. Our sympathy is always with underdog, with the Palestinians. The Israelis cannot do, should not do what they are doing. 50 years of humiliation of the Palestinian people. And the Israelis should be the first to be sensitive to this. Survivors of Holocaust, survivors of hundreds of years of exclusion, discrimination. They should be the most loving people in the world doing what they do, and regardless of what the, the excuses Palestinians might give them for the violence. Regardless, and I say might, <laughs> might give them, as, as they see it, regardless, they should not. The Palestinians didn't wake up one day and decide to become terrorists. They resort to violence after years and years of humiliation and exclu exclusion. If the Israelis don't understand that, if the Americans don't understand that. The other day I was reading in the New York Times that Barack Obama now has a whole list of top American specialists with 30 years, 40 years, 20 years experience to advise him on uh, Palestine-Israeli conflict. And there are names of candidates. I thought to myself, if I were Barack Obama, precisely all those people with 30 years of experience in advising four American presidents I would say, no. <laughs> Great expertise, all these 30, 40 years, what have they advised? <laughs> Barack Obama is fresh, fresh face, fresh mind, find fresh face to advise him. If he goes back to all those PhDs, experts, economists. <laughs> uh, uh, apologize. We are not excluding PhDs. Uh, 